about five weeks ago we had a Sunday night debate in our ecclesial hall with a pastor, Chris Kernahan, from Woodcroft Revival Centre. And the topic of the debate was that speaking in tongues is essential for salvation. So I thought that was a useful topic for rest of scriptures tonight and to look at some of the passages used to support the concept that speaking in tongues is vital. Pastor Kernahan was a very pleasant man. He brought along about 20 young people and they were all delightful young people. And uh, the, the pity of it all was that the scriptural understanding was so shallow and superficial. In fact, their aspirations for their young people would be pretty much what we would like for our young people. Staggeringly, he opened his debate in Ezekiel 36. Come here, you, you may not have realised the way some people use the scriptures. Ezekiel 36 has seemed a very unusual place to open the batting, but that's what he wanted. Ezekiel 36, 25. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And verse 36. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. So this is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. And in verse 31, you shall remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. And when the spirit comes into your heart, then you loathe your past life, whether you're into drugs or drunkenness or whatever, you loathe all this because that's what possession of the Spirit does. And this seems very strange to us, doesn't it? Because so obviously the chapter is about Israel. You know, verse 24, I'll take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries. You only have to flick back how critical it is to read the scriptures in their context. Verse 8, you, O mountains of Israel, Ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. Right? This chapter starts, verse 1, with the mountains of Israel. But now this is Woodcroft Revival Centre getting the spirit. Didn't go on to ask about the Valley of Dry Bones and how that applied to Woodcroft Revival Centre. But I've actually heard Pope John Paul say that actually relates to the Catholic Church and how it was all pulled back together again. So it's amazing what some people do with the scriptures. On our part, the first passage we used, and I think this is always a good one with these people, is Deuteronomy chapter 13. I was put onto this by Brother Graham Wigsell many years ago. But in Deuteronomy 13, if you just turn back there, there's some wise words given by Moses to the people about idolaters. So just take a straw man, Pope John Paul II. No, none of us ever met the man. We don't know whether he is a nice fellow or a nasty bloke, because none of us never met him. I think he must have had a little bit of ego to have everyone bow down to him, but we won't go there. But it's not real, and, and he taught possession of spirit and spirit signs. So Moses says, if there arise among you a prophet, a dreamer of dreams, and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, where he's spoken to thee, saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, you shall not hearken to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is proving you to know whether you love him. So somebody comes along and says, look, I can do this incredible sign, right? I can raise a dead person or whatever, they walk on hot coals or speak in tongues. And Moses says, well, just because they can do it is no proof, right? People can do remarkable things. 
people can walk on hot coals. I know about the footballers who tried that and burnt their feet and couldn't play for months, but you know, there are people in Fiji who can do this, right? Not playing around. But when they say, this is a proof that I have some power and you must listen to my teachings, Moses said, no, they are teaching you in verse 2 to go after other gods which you have not known and serve them. So even though they may seem to have some miraculous power, if they're teaching you about a false god, don't follow them. Now, the same has to be true of John Paul II or Pastor Kernahan. They might be able to evidence some incredible miracles, but if they are teaching a different God, they are to be rejected. In fact, in verse 5, the person teaching the false God was to be put to death. Now, John Paul II argues that he's that apparently he's done two miracles since he was dead. It's a bit imaginative, isn't it, how people, dead people can do miracles? And now he's going to be canonised as a saint. And before he died, people claimed he did miracles. But he teaches a false god. He teaches a trinity. He teaches heaven going. He teaches the kingdom of God and the church. He teaches devil, the whole works. He teaches another religion. He's got another god, a supernatural devil in competition with the father. So even if this man could supposedly do miracles, and this Pastor Kernahan was telling us about up in Papua New Guinea, up in the highlands, that their church had raised someone from the dead or something, as if we could fly to Papua New Guinea and find the evidence of this. It doesn't matter. They were teaching falsehood. And even if they could speak in tongues, they are teaching another God who we are not interested in. We are interested in Yahweh, the God of the Bible, not their gods. So fabulous signs are no evidence. And when you come to speaking in tongues, it's very clear that glossalia, this ability to babble and to disengage the mind, is found amongst pagan religions just as it's found amongst um, supposedly spirit-gifted people. How could that be the case? If it is indeed the evidence of God. Okay, now, what we were very careful to point out to the revivalists is the Christadelphians strongly believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe God is active through the Spirit in the lives of believers. He can heal people if he wants. He can guide the lives of believers through the angels. He leaves the evidence of the Spirit in his word, which is a great power in the lives of believers. But the difference from the first century is we do not have this power invested in us. We pray to God and he works according to his will, even though his will does not altogether seem easy for us to understand at times. He is a God who's at work through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't let the Pentecostals tell us that we do not believe in the power of of the spirit. Okay, the other line of argument I think which is quite important is when you start talking about speaking in tongues essential for salvation that this is not true anywhere in the Bible. The simple teaching of the Bible is that we are saved through faith. Right? And we won't look up these passages now. But Ephesians 2.8, by grace are you saved through faith. 2 Timothy 3.15, we are wise unto salvation through faith. And how does that wisdom come? It comes because the holy scriptures, which are themselves a manifestation of the spirit, make us wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
It is a power to salvation to everyone that believes. Now, these revivalists actually have speaking at tongues at two levels. They have speaking at tongues at home, which everybody has to do, and then they have speaking in tongues in the church, which only certain people with a particular gift do. And unless you can speak the tongues at home, you're really not in it, right? Because this is the manifestation that God has come into your life. But in all these New Testament passages, we never read Paul ever saying anything like that. He says, the just will live by faith, not because they have some supernatural ability. And we'll just jump over these, but the bottom one, really clearly Jesus tells us how to be saved. In John 10, in the last week of his life, he tells us, or just a bit, a bit longer than that, but in the very last days of his life, he's telling his disciples very simply how salvation happens. My sheep listen to my voice, and I, Jesus, then know them. And my sheep follow me, and I give them eternal life. Now, there's nothing in there about supernatural gifts or the ability to speak in tongues. Jesus makes it very simple. You listen to me, says Jesus, then I know you, and you follow me, and I give you eternal life. Hebrews 11. Has the plan of salvation changed? Is there some new step? that you must be able to babble in tongues to be saved. No. Hebrews 11, as we know, is unequivocal. We are saved by faith. By faith, the elders received a good report. By faith, Abel offered unto God. And verse 6, we know in Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please God. No, no, I didn't say without speaking of tongues. It's impossible to please God, it says, if you don't have faith. Faith is the substratum because faith then works. It's active and lively to produce things pleasing to God. Okay, now clearly the gift of tongues and other gifts were for limited periods of time. It was always so. The Holy Spirit was given to people for particular purposes for particular times. And central to the purpose of the Holy Spirit in John 14 was guidance into all truth. But even there, Jesus says it's only for the age, not for all time, but for a particular age or period. Now let's come to Mark 16, because Jesus definitely promised speaking in tongues. Now we quote verse 15 and 16 all the time. Go into the world, preach the gospel to every creature. If you believe and are baptised, you'll be saved. If you believe not, you'll be condemned. And then Jesus says in verse 17 of Mark 16, These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, is this a promise to all believers of all time? Because the... Um, second statement is they shall speak with new tongues. Now we use this passage to say that baptism is important to all generations. He that believeth and is baptised shall be saved. Isn't verse 17 then applicable to all generations? These signs shall follow them that believe. But in the companion passage in Luke 24, Luke records that these signs shall follow you. Right? Now, clearly in the context he's speaking to the apostles who are going to preach to every creature in the Roman world. Verse 15, they're going to baptise people who will be saved and the signs will come. Now, even though baptism was clearly something that Jesus expected to continue and Paul therefore reinforced it, there's no reinforcing of the signs which Jesus promises 
to you who believe, right? To you, my disciples. Now, let's look at the list. First on the list is cast out devils. So top of the list is to heal mental illness. Now, you will recall in Jesus' ministry, this was also top of his list. You go back to Mark 1. Jesus focused on healing mentally ill people. Oh yes, he healed lots of blind people, deaf people, but he focused on healing the mentally ill. Why? Because you can understand the gospel if you're deaf or blind, but you can't understand the gospel if you're mentally ill. So this was number one. But the, the revivalists can't pick out number two, speak with no tongues, and no, we can't do number one, cast out devils, heal the mentally ill. And afterwards we asked them about picking up snakes and they claimed this could be done. But I think most people who have experienced the Pentecostals picking up poison snakes, it's not like Paul where the snake came out of the fire and fastened on his hand. Rather they train snakes not to bite them. And we asked them about drinking deadly things and they told us a story about some little revivalist kid who drink, uh, drank some... Uh, rat poison and survived I said well my dad eats a wolf and rat poison every day it's what actually keeps him alive but, um, so, yes it can be dangerous but I mean the problem here always is they're going to put their experience up so all we got all night was not the bible but their experience and of course last of all lay hands on the sick and they shall recover and at that point, we got curious stories of what happened in Papua New Guinea. We didn't have any cases in Adelaide. Now, coming back to speaking with new tongues, to use Jesus' word, the particular Greek word is kainos, which means new to them. All right? So if I tell you I have a new car, it could be 25 years old, right? But it's new to me. He did not use the word, Greek word neos, which means novel or brand new. Right? So to say I'm going to speak in new tongues doesn't mean that they've never been heard before. It's just that I haven't been able to use these tongues in the past. So I know in Corinthians, we're coming to in a minute, we use the term unknown tongues, but Jesus' expression, new tongues, does not mean glossalia, babble, which nobody's ever heard before. Okay, well let's come to the gift of languages in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, let's understand first of all, remind ourselves, something you all know, that this section is in the scriptures because the Corinthians had a problem. They actually all wanted to be tongues, as if the Corinthian congregation could be one huge tongue. No legs, feet, arms, eyes, face, just one huge tongue. They were all obsessed with tongues and it was actually causing damage to their ecclesia. Now, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul is not saying, oh, tongues is a dreadful thing, let's eliminate it from the congregation. In fact, at the very end, in verse 39, he says, there, Wherefore, brethren, covered to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. So he says clearly, I'm not telling you not to use tongues, but I am telling you that prophecy is a superior gift. Now, let's be quite clear that we're talking here about the gift of languages. Now, this is a matter of confusion, even in the brotherhood. Sadly, Pentecostals can download our pamphlets where brethren argue that glossalia is the gift of Babel. But that is not reasonable. In Acts chapter 2, there were 15 different languages. Quite clearly, the Persians heard them speak Persian. 
the Cappadocians heard them speak Cappadocian. Every man heard them speak in his own language, as we read in Acts 2 verse 6. Quite clear. Brother Brian said, should we read the word unknown in 1 Corinthians 14? Well, it's really a redundant word. It occurs there in verse 2, verse 4, verse 13, and verse 14. Four times. And it's put in by the translators to convey something which is clearly not in the Greek language. They claim that they were interpreting or adding to the sense but clearly it detracts from it. And it's not an unknown tongue. It is a known language. Now, during the course of our debate, the debater particularly referred to verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14. In the law, and we know he's quoting from Isaiah 28, in the law is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people and yet, for all that, will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Now, let's go back to Isaiah 28 and see whether Isaiah is talking about Babel or is he talking about language. So let's come back to Isaiah 28. I hope you appreciate I'm going to deal with 1 Corinthians 14 thematically tonight rather than verse by verse. But hopefully that will work for you. So first of all, context, context, context. What is one, uh, Isaiah 28 about? Well, verse 1, it's a denunciation of the rulers of Ephraim who lived in Samaria, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. And God pronounces judgment against this group. He calls them in verse 3, the crown of pride. And in verse 7, he says, one of the big problems is that you are drunk. You're all drunk. The priest, the prophet, the birds through strong drink, they're out of the way through strong drink. And in the first sense, it's obviously literal. And then, by extension, it's metaphorical. They're drunk with all the foolish ideas around them. Verse 8, there's vomit and filthiness. The prophet should come and work on North Terrace, where I am, if he wants to see. This is our normal experience. And in verse uh, 9, the prophet asks, Whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? And... Most of the translations then pronounce verse 10 as sort of this drunken ditty in which they slur their words. And it's quite interesting to actually see the way it sounds in the Hebrew language. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And it's repeated in verse 13. But it says in verse 11, with stammerings of lip and with another tongue will he speak to these people. So God is going to choose to arrest their attention by speaking to them with a different tongue. And the Pentecostals claim that in 1 Corinthians 14, this is glossalia. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, that this is just blah. Blah, 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 whatever. But what was it in the original context? Who was coming to speak to them in another language? Well, the prophet goes on to explain um, in verse 18, I am going to disannul your agreement with the grave, an overflowing scourge shall pass through, and ye shall be trodden down by it. So who was this overflowing judgment that was going to come across the men of Samaria? Well, we know who it was because Isaiah has previously prophesied about this power as early back as in Isaiah 10 and again in Isaiah 
I think it's about 15. It's the power of Assyria and it's coming and it's going to speak to this people in another tongue. And will they listen? The answer is no. Right? Their captors are going to speak to them in a different language and they will hear divine pronouncements from the Assyrians in a different language. Will they listen? No. Verse 13, the end. They will be broken and snared and taken. Now this has got nothing to do specifically with the Corinthian congregation. It's all about the men of Samaria. So what's its relevance? Why does Paul quote it? Because he's showing that God had prophesied in the days of Isaiah that people with a different language would rebuke his people and they would be shamefully denounced by their captors in a different language. And what's the point in 1 Corinthians 14? That when people hear them the other language, they will be convinced. They will hear it. It is for the unbeliever to try and change them, says Paul, just as Isaiah says it was for the unbelievers of Isaiah's day that they might be convinced that they must change. Yet they would not hear. So the gift of tongues, the ability to speak another language and hear coming from the Assyrian captors would not necessarily change their hearts, but it was a sign from God. Now, previously, and we've got the quote on the screen, back in Deuteronomy 28, Moses had prophesied a similar thing, that they would hear from people with another language. Deuteronomy 28 and verse 49, the prophecy of the Romans coming as the eagle, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. They will come with a different language, a nation of fierce countenance which shall not regard the person of the old nor show favour to the young. So this was prophecy that their captors would speak a different language and they would hear rebuke indirectly from God in another language. In Isaiah 28, Aramaic. In Deuteronomy 28, Latin. Now, people who believe in speaking in tongues make a lot out of this word glossa and they pick up Glossalia, which is found amongst pagans around the world. And they say, this isn't languages, this is tongues. If it was languages, why doesn't God use the, why doesn't Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 use the word for languages? First point, in Acts chapter 2, the word glossa, tongues, and the word in the Greek dialectos, languages, are used interchangeably. Now, you look at that word dialectos, and we've all heard the word dialect. We use the word dialect to mean a subgroup of a language. But in those days, it was used for a language. So if you come back to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, we find these terms, tongues and languages, used interchangeably. Okay, in verse 4 of Acts 2, the 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But then in verse 6, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in their own language, Greek dialectos, and they were all amazed and marvelled. And then in verse 8, we hear every man speak in their own tongue, dialectos, language. And then in verse 11, it goes back to glossa, tongues. Cretes and Arabians, we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, the tongue speakers say, well, I think this is all tongues. This is, this is not languages. Maybe in... Acts 2, they spoke some different things, but clearly the word glossa is used. Now, and they say, why? Why? 
are both words used, it doesn't make sense. Well, it does make sense because the word tongues implies they were given an oral gift. Because you were given the gift of tongues to speak in Egyptian did not mean you could write Egyptian. It was an oral gift. That's why the word tongues is used. There was no need for these men here to be able to write Egyptian hieroglyphics. The gift they needed was to speak. So it's called tongues, the gift of tongues. And it was also a gift of languages. <coughs> Does that make sense? Is that reasonable? Because right? I don't think the Pentecostal case that it's got to be an unknown tongue makes sense at all. <coughs> and in the book of Revelation, and we've got the quotes up there, we have this term, or kindreds, nations, people and languages. Now are you telling me that that's all kindreds, nations, people and Babel? No, we're talking about people who come up from all sorts of nations, all sorts of races and speak all sorts of different languages and they're all with Christ. So when we get to the judgment seat, there will be people who speak Hindi, People who speak English, people who speak Mandarin, people who speak Swahili, and they'll all be there, irrespective of the language they come from. Now, the Greek word is not glossalia. The Greek word is glossa. And the tongue speakers extend it in 1 Corinthians 14 to glossalia. But... Glossalia, as I said before, is found amongst pagans. People can loose the tongue and speak this babble who have no connection with God, Christ or the Bible at all. Now when we come back to 1 Corinthians 14, this was not unintelligible babble. It could be understood. Right? In fact, our sixth point on the slide is only a group called the unlearned, the idiotes. That's curious that word idiot just means someone who doesn't know it, hasn't been to the right school. It doesn't mean you're an idiot at all. The idiotes, the unlearned people, would not understand. So we come, for example, to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 16. Now he's explaining why you need interpreters. Else in verse 16, when you bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say Amen at your giving of thanks, seeing he doesn't understand what you're saying? Now why is he unlearned? Is he unlearned in the Scriptures? Is that what it's saying? As was said in Acts 4 of Peter and John, they're unlearned, they're idiots. In the scriptures, they didn't go to the right rabbinical school. Well, I don't think that's the idea here. I think the idea is they're unlearned in the language. So if you get up and speak in French or Gaulish or whatever it was called back in those days, and some people might know the language of the Gauls and they'll be fine, they'll say Amen. But there'll be many people who haven't known languages. Remember, Corinth was a port. Lots of sailors coming through, lots of different languages there. So there's some possibility. Why would you be able to speak Gaulish if nobody who spoke Gaul ever came through the door? The gift was given because there would be people come there who might speak that language. But at times, there'll be people there who won't understand what's being said at all. They're unlearned. They don't know languages. They can't say Amen when you give thanks. Similarly over the page in verse 23, if the whole congregation become together into one place and all speak with tongues, there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. So unlearned doesn't mean you don't know the scriptures. Unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say, you're mad? So you come in, you don't know any languages. And you suddenly hear Lionel speaking Lithuanian and you say, what am I hearing? This is crazy. You know, they're all nuts. 
right? And it's talking about the unlearned. Anyone who knew Lithuanian would understand what Lionel was speaking. And again in verse 24. If all prophesy, and there coming one that believeth not, or unlearned, he is convinced. So if you use prophecy, you actually help this person. Church, can I ask a question? Sure. Yep. The, um, now, when was the noise abroad, uh, abroad here? The multitude came together. You're talking Acts 2 now? That's right, yeah. Yep. Found it because if every man heard them speak in their own language, was there one person speaking and everyone heard them in their own language? Or one person spoke and the apostles went around with everybody that was there and explained it? Now, now, we've discussed that, and, and I don't think it was the gift of hearing. I think it was a gift of speaking. So I actually think people were speaking, different members of the 120, were speaking those different languages so that everybody could hear the gospel being taught in their language. Right? Now, I know some people think it's a gift of hearing, and that you can hear it in your tongue and then speak it, but I don't think that's what the scriptures imply. It was speaking, it was speaking yeah. But I'm I'm prepared to agree to disagree if someone feels strongly about that. Okay, my seventh point in one Corinthians fourteen verse ten, Paul says there are many kinds of voices, Greek sounds in the world, and none of them is without signification. Right? So he's not talking about babble. He's talking about sounds that people make which actually have some meaning. By the way, I found diaglot quite helpful for this chapter because it puts language every occasion of the word glossa. Verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning, so every sound has a meaning, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, a foreigner. Yeah? So... Paul is actually a Roman citizen, but if he speaks in Lithuanian, we'll all think he's a foreigner. We don't believe that he's actually a Roman citizen at all. Okay, so my first point at 10 to 7 is that it's about languages. It's a gift of tongues. It's a spoken gift. It's an oral gift, not a written gift. And it's a gift of languages. Second point, in Corinthians, tongues is always at the bottom of the list of gifts. And when you start talking to revivalists, they put tongues way up the top. Why? Because I don't think they can drink poison or handle snakes or do all these other things. So they put tongues right at the list. But you follow Paul's argument, Corinthians. He always puts the gift of tongues at the bottom of the list. So, for example, 1 Corinthians 12, we talk, read about the various manifestations of the Spirit, verses 8 to 10. He talks about wisdom, faith, miracles, prophecy, and right down the end of the line, we get, end of verse 10, divers kinds of languages and the interpretation of these languages. It's last on the list. It's the least critical of the gifts. Okay? Over the page, verse 28, we have the list of the people that God has set in the congregation. Apostles, two, prophets, three, teachers, four, miracles, five, healing, six, help, seven, governments, and eight, diversities of tongues, right? Always last on the list. Why do the tongue speakers insist on putting it at number one? Chapter 14, the chapter opens. Pursue love. Love is what really matters that holds an ecclesia together and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Prophesy. Prophesying was far more important than the gift of languages. And he explains why as he proceeds through the chapter. Verse 5. 
Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the ecclesia may receive edification. Oh, this, they say, oh, well, as long as you've got interpreter, then they're equal. But how does he end? We've already seen in verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak in tongues. He actually says in this chapter, verse 5, I would that ye all spake with tongues. Implication, not everybody did. Now our revivalists got around that by saying, oh, well, everyone speaks with tongues at home, but not everyone speaks with tongues in the church. Well, that's a nice artificial divide, but I don't find it anywhere in the Bible. Third point, languages are not a universal sign of the Spirit. Yes, they are second in Jesus' list in Mark 16, verse 17. But in Acts, only occurs three times. Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. Why did they appear on that day? Because they were essential for communication of the gospel. The next time they appear is in Acts 10 with Cornelius. Why did they appear? Because we've got Latin speakers there. Right? The gift of languages is very important. Maybe some of the soldiers spoke different languages. Then we get them in Ephesus in Acts 19, a place where different tongues and languages circulate. So Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, 29 to 30, all do not speak in different languages. Not everybody had the gift of tongues. For the revivalists to assert from 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and 14, if you do not have the gift of tongues, you cannot be saved. How can that be possible? It didn't even happen in the first century. Paul indeed says, I am willing for you to all speak in different languages, but it wasn't the case. Okay, next point. The gift of languages would clearly stop. And we can't read 1 Corinthians 14 without reading 1 Corinthians 13. Because Paul is saying, well, you can make all this grand sound in different languages, but love is the critical thing. And in verse 8, love does not stop. Prophecy stop. Tongues shall stop. And it really is the word stop there. They will, they will cease. Right? Bullinger says this word means to make an end of or cause to stop. Right? They'll cease. And I think it means they won't reoccur. This is not even a gift that will be needed in the kingdom age. Because presumably everyone will speak the same language. Okay. So the tongues were going to stop. And in Acts 2.38... We've got two minutes to go back to Acts 2. Acts 2 and verse 38 and 39. I know that there are different interpretations of this verse, but I'll tell you what I think it means. Verse 39, the promise, which I believe is the promise of verse 33, the promise of the Holy Spirit. It's to the same group that Joel prophesied. You, your children, and the Gentiles are far off. Of course, the revivalists want to make a far off for all time, but it's not necessarily used that way in the New Testament. In Ephesians 2, Paul talks about those who are afar off as the Gentiles, separated from the hope of Israel. The promise is not to all generations of all time because that's not what Joel prophesied in chapter 2. It's to you and to your children, to the Gentiles, and only as many of those as God will call. And if you want some extra support, Romans 5 verse 5, Paul says the gifts were given to us, past tense. How are the gifts passed on? Acts 8, unambiguously, they were handed on by the apostles, with the exception of the Cornelius story. When the apostles died, the gifts died with them. Where are these signs of what Jesus said about languages and healing the mentally ill, etc.?
So we are confident, brothers and sisters, that in God's grace in the kingdom, we will inherit gifts, the gift of healing, the gift of wisdom, the gift that we can impart to other people as teachers. And the scriptures are very clear about this. Paul calls the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 6, 5, the power of the age to come. It's not for all believers, for all time, for the present. It's the power of the future. Or in Ephesians 1, 14, the pledge of the inheritance. And as we read the Old Testament scriptures, we know the kingdom's coming. And all these good things will come for all men and women. The lame shall walk, the dumb shall speak. And the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit can be used by the immortals to bring about the healing the world needs. That's the promise. When we ask these revivalists for real evidence of speaking in tongues, it had to come from their experience. I was a six-year-old boy at home and I was praying to Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart, and suddenly I started babbling. That's about the best we could get because there is no Bible evidence that there is a gift of babble. There was a gift of languages, the apostles used it, and it's passed. I hope that's helpful and we all are looking forward to meeting the apostles who had these marvellous gifts in the meantime, it's our task to go out and preach the gospel with the skills that we've got. And yeah, one of the greatest blessings in 2013 to preach the gospel is English. Yeah, you can go into many parts of the world. You do not need languages anymore. I can speak to most Chinese in English and Japanese and they understand me. Right? We have a vehicle that we can reach out and we're probably not using it as well we could. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Mike Steele, and I'm a Christadelphian, and I've been one for pretty well all my adult life. You're probably wanting to know what does the word Christadelphia mean. It simply means brethren of Christ. And we believe that if you want to be a true follower of Christ, you really need to know what this book, the Holy Bible, really does teach. And we would love to have the opportunity to show you what the Christadelphians believe and how it is based on this Bible. We get very excited about the Bible because it foretells uh, the future in such accurate uh, detail, particularly Bible prophecy. And we believe the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is very soon to happen on the face of this earth, particularly when you look at the prophecies regarding the nation of Israel and Russia and Europe and other nations. You'll be fascinated to know what this Bible really does teach about what is going on in our earth today. Um, we would encourage you to have a look at this website that we've put together for you. Uh, it uh, shows you all about the Christadelphians, what we believe, and also what this Bible really does teach. Uh, Christadelphians are what we call a lay movement. That is, nobody gets paid anything. So we're not on a recruitment drive whatsoever to get more Christadelphians. We simply want you to understand what this book really does teach and have the opportunity to search out the matter for yourself. So enjoy our website. It talks all about uh, the Bible. It talks about our beliefs. And it even has uh, some of the seminars that we, we do quite often in our halls. So uh, enjoy it. And uh, if you need to contact us at any time, please do so through the website and uh, we would be only too pleased to, uh, to be able to talk to you further about these important matters. Thank you very much.